Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our program, Climate Change in Durham Region, What Can We Do Now?, brought to you by the Ajax Public Library. We are so pleased that everyone could join us for this important conversation. I'm Julia Campbell, Adult Services Librarian at the Ajax Public Library. Your host for this evening, along with myself, is Sarah Dodge, Coordinator of Community Engagement at the Ajax Public Library. If you experience any technical difficulties tonight, we recommend that you exit the program and re-enter. If you continue to have difficulties, please place a comment in the chat and a staff member will assist you. If we have any phone participants this evening, please press star nine to request assistance. This event is being recorded and will be posted on our library website for follow-up viewing. To this end, we will, be, we will be turning off your webcams, voice or phone so that you are not displayed in the recording. Our format for this evening's program will include a presentation followed by a Q&A portion. I encourage you to please enter any questions for our presenter into the chat. I am so pleased to introduce our expert for tonight, Dr. Daniel Hornwig, an Associate Dean and Professor in the Faculty of Energy Systems and Nuclear Science at Ontario Tech University. He is also the Chair of the Durham Region Roundtable on Climate Change. He teaches courses on emerging energy systems, fossil fuel energy conversion, measuring and modeling sustainability, the future role of nuclear energy and hydrogen power systems. Dan published the report, Cities and Climate Change Responding to an Urgent Agenda, which influenced the World Bank and its members into a more aggressive response to climate change, mitigation and adaptation. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Hornwig to begin his presentation. Great, thanks Julia and good evening everyone. Um, happy Earth Day. Um, and I thought maybe what we might do tonight is, is to start, uh, let's start at the global scale and then the last few slides, maybe what we might be able to do in Durham. Um, so, uh, I'm trying to get my slides to advance. There we go. Um, all right, so these are um, the first two, urbanization and demographics are the two most important things shaping the planet today um, and have been for the last 75 years or so. We hear a lot about the information economy or the fourth industrial revolution, the digital economy, the sharing economy, but it's really urbanization and demographics that are changing uh, the world. Um, and what we're seeing as a function of that or what's a response to that is degradation of our natural environment, Lake Ontario, for example, invasive species, rising temperatures, loss of biodiversity and climate change, the big one. Um, climate change, everybody working on urban issues and big complex issues, we always said, well, climate change is the first wicked problem that humanity's had to face. Um, we're actually getting a bit of a dry run or a, on, on climate change with COVID. And so far as a planet, as a country, uh, as a province, we're not doing very well. Um, and it's not looking good that these are the behaviors we want to see replicated for climate. So um, the first question I suppose is what is a wicked problem? And a wicked problem really is one that doesn't have an easy solution. Um, we don't know the answers and it may not even be solvable. We like to think sometimes the wicked problems, you know, it's a, it's a bad politician, it's a bad neighbor, it's a bad country, but there's not really anybody to blame in a wicked problem. It's more like a plate of spaghetti and then trying to find a single strand. Um, the only thing that we have uh, that defines a wicked problem is that they always involve humans and humans, we have all of these weird behaviors, frailties and nervousness and fears about this country or that neighbor. And when you put them in cities and globally, uh, you end up with a lot of uh, challenges, climate change being the big one. So back to this, where are we? Um, a student graduating today from Ontario Tech in their careers, not their lives, but their careers, the world's cities will double. Um, and that's just enormous, a huge issue. 
Um, I guess the first question might be, a lot of people say, well, why are cities growing? Why are they so important? Uh, and basically cities make us rich. Cities are where we go to university, where we find love, where we might find a Starbucks. Uh, cities bring us together and cities drive our cultures and cities drive our wealth. Cities also drive our pollution. Um, don't worry about the numbers on this, but, but maybe just a sense of scale would be useful here. So my dad was born in 1927. When he was born, there were about 2 billion people living in cities. Uh, and the per capita average wealth global was around $1,000 a person. He grew up during the Depression in the Netherlands, World War, World War II. My dad died uh, last year. And when he died, the global population was around 8 billion. We had almost 6.5 billion people living in cities. The number of cities over, over a million went just in my dad's lifetime from 11 to more than uh, almost 400 cities. The pace of growth in the world is just staggering. And that's really what's driving climate change. Um, the other way to look at this, which is a bit scary, I think, are not scary. It's a bit important to figure out how this is going to affect us in Durham. So much of the world's geopolitical architecture was decided at the end of World War II. We had the UN, we had the World Bank, we had the IMF, the World Trade Organization eventually. When that happened, about 60 of the world's 100 largest cities were in Europe, uh, North America, Japan, and a few of our, our, um, our partner countries that we like to call the OECD. They were the rich country club. By the end of this century, we will have less than 15 of those largest cities. So the world is fundamentally changing. And to a large extent, you know, he who pays the piper calls the tune, right? Well, who's calling the, or who's paying the piper is significantly shifting. We're going through all these machinations right now because China's emerging, but India is right behind it. And then the big one that's coming is Africa. Um, I like to show this slide sometimes to, to, to illustrate this for people in the GTA. So we always love to say, oh, Toronto, it's so busy. It's so big. It's so dense. Toronto right now is about the 55th largest city. This is the GTHA, 55th largest city in the world. And chance, and it's growing. It's the fastest growing city in North America. But by the end of this century, it's likely not going to be in the top 100. So every year for the rest of this century, Toronto drops a place in terms of the ranking for largest cities, even though it's growing like gangbusters. Um, I like to put this slide up, and then you, this is the problem with giving these talks uh, online. And I say, does anybody know where this is? Anyways. Um, this is Buenos Aires. And you might say, well, why is there a picture of Buenos Aires here? So this is three blocks away from the, the home of the current Pope. Now, if you were to ask me what are the most enlightened organizations in the world, probably the Catholic Church is not one that jumps out first. But the Catholic Church, for the first time in history, has picked a Pope outside of Europe. And one may say, well, why is that? And really... <laughs> It isn't because they're all that enlightened about, oh, you know, it's because they know where the growth is happening. The growth is happening outside of Europe. The growth is happening outside of North America. Um, cities are growing in Asia and then Africa. All right, let's go to, to climate change, um, which is our, our topic. Um, this is Canada's, and you may have heard that today uh, Prime Minister Trudeau announced new, more aggressive targets. These are our Paris commitments. You can see the little yellow dots. Canada has the dubious distinction in the world of being the country that has set the, the most targets under the UN framework um, that we failed in meeting those targets. We're the first country, only country really, that withdrew from the Kyoto commitment. We failed our Copenhagen commitments. And today we didn't, we actually increased the ambition of our Paris commitments. And you, we could probably take a poll right now and say, what are the odds of us meeting these targets, whether there are 20, 30? And you saw today, I don't know if you noticed that the targets were set as between 40 and 45% reduction. Um, 
2035 and then 2050. Um, I would, well, I'm not gonna bet, but I, I anyways, good luck to us is, is really what, what the message is for these targets. So this is the, the part of the, of back to climate change and why it's such a wicked problem. Now this, this data is a little bit old, the slide's a little bit old. And the reason you can tell that it's old right away is that Canada on this slide is actually lower than the United States in per capita greenhouse gas emissions. We're somewhere around 19 in this slide. And the US is just under 20. Well, Canada now is around 24. We are the highest country in the world per capita, apart from one or two other um, smaller countries or um, Saudi Arabia which is actually decreasing faster than us. And the thing I wanted to highlight here is that pie in the middle there. So high income countries generate about 48%. The, the numbers are still about right of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. And we have about 2 billion people. Middle income countries generate around 49%. They have 3 billion people. And the, see that two and a half percent? That's almost three and a half billion people. So there's more than 3 billion people in the world over on the right-hand side of that graph, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Bangladesh, Sudan, Nigeria, that basically don't gener generate any greenhouse gas emissions. And they are the ones who are already being impacted by greenhouse gas, by climate change. And they are being impacted more than anyone. So you have this um, huge inequity um, and that is probably the single most important issue for the next 50 years on the planet is how we address that inequity, how we do it in Durham, how we do it in Ontario, Canada, uh, and around the world. And this is my favorite slide. Um, this is Betu. I just stumbled across this picture um, on Al Jazeera. And the reason it's bizarre, I think that this really is an, a hand-me-down t-shirt that he has from the, uh, you know, the Union Pearson Express. Betu, this picture is now three years old, I think. Betu was taken out of school when he was 13 years old to sell those oranges. His family couldn't afford to put him in school. So he sells oranges um, and he, he basically makes, how much was it? He has to sell 15 oranges over two weeks. He makes about $1.50 every two weeks, 75. It's worth pulling a kid out of school for 75 cents a week. His sister was also taken out of school. And the thing that's ironic or whatever in this picture is that Betu lives in Vera, which is the third largest city in Mozambique. He's now 16 years old. And I don't know if you remember the town of city, it's a city of almost a million now, fourth largest city in Mozambique, completely leveled by um, Cyclone Ida. Uh, in 2019, March 15th, 2019. There are about 250 million Betus in the world, kids who are being taken out of school because they can't afford to be in school. Betu wanted to be an engineer, love to have him at Ontario Tech, um, but he was taken out of school. And I, now just think about that for a second, that we now have 250 million smart kids all around the world who Betu's going to start asking questions pretty soon about, hey, where did that cyclone come from? Hey, why did I get taken out of school? And life's not fair. And we're setting in place the ingredients for incredible angst and anger and unrest around the world that will affect us in Durham. Um, Another way to look at the climate change issue is this is what I would say, this is the money slide or the be, be afraid, be very afraid slide. So countries are the ones who love to go and sign all these agreements. And it was Canada that was on online today that said, these are our targets. But countries don't do much other than go to conferences and talk about things. It's the cities where the rubber hits the road. Cities generate 80, more than 80% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. They generate 80% of the world's economy, but cities, just the way it works, they've decided that they will be under the, the, the governance of a country. But really we, it's the cities that we need to get to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And with, so what the world has signed on to with the Paris Agreement is that this is the world's 100 largest cities. 
Um, you can see Toronto, that's the GTA, that's us in Durham. We're included in Toronto. Sorry about that, Durham, but we're all part of the GTA. Um, and we've basically said that we have to get all of the world cities into that bottom right hand uh, rectangle where there's no cities at the moment. And we have to do that in 30 years, less than 30 years now. And each city, it's, it's more challenging than a moon launch for each city. And we have to do that you know, a thousand fold over to get these cities into that low, lower per capita greenhouse gas emissions while still um, having enough uh, peace, um, peace and order and good governance, which in turn generates economy. Um, so that's, that's our challenge. All right, let's, let's go to Durham. Um, so this is, um, Durham has a, a very, very good climate adaptation plan. And really the, the summary for the climate adaptation plan for Durham is wetter, warmer, wilder. Um, we really need to start preparing for, uh, start adapting for climate change. Um, it's coming, it's here. We're going to have much more flooding. We're going to have uh, significant changes to, to weather patterns, um, more storms, uh, quite a few things. Um, okay, so this is, this is uh, Durham's energy plan, or the low carbon pathway. And the thing basically in, in Durham, the things we have to focus on are transportation and how we heat our buildings. Those are the two biggies. We also have some industry cement in, in Clarington, for example. Um, we have pretty good understanding of what needs to be done, but we don't have a whole lot of faith that we're gonna be able to do it. Um, and here is just another way of looking at that. 36% of our emissions are from transportation, 30% from, from heating our buildings, 28% from industry. The huge advantage that we have in Ontario is that we have among the lowest carbon electricity uh, in the world. And that's largely because of the nuclear plants in uh, Darlington, Pickering and Bruce. Unfortunately, Pickering will be closing and most of that will be replaced by natural gas. So Ontario's electricity, uh, green, uh, carbon emissions from electricity are actually going to go up quite significantly. So this is a big deal um, for all of us. Okay. So this is, I thought this would be, a, a, this is, was on the front page of the Toronto Star way back in 2011 when I worked at the World Bank. Um, uh, I was dating my current wife at the time who I'm, I'm, I'm actually surprised that she went through and, and married me because she was the in charge of um, government relations at OPG at the time. I published this, this obscure article in a journal that nobody reads, um, but it got picked up by the Toronto Star because it had a couple interesting facts in that, where because we had the best data in the world, really, that when we were at the World Bank that we found from a researcher at U of D that showed, lo and behold, three communities within the GTA, residential per capita greenhouse gas emissions, Whitby, 13 tons per person, and East York at 1.3. So 10 times, an order of magnitude more, with roughly the same affluence, Whitby was the largest um, area within the, 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 the study. Um, and it's all transportation, big houses, swimming pools, uh, lots of natural gas to heat the house. And so you could see that, you know, what you buy is important, but where you live is even more important. So this is a, an interesting example of what we have facing us in Durham is that the nature of the, of the way the houses are laid out and the communities are laid out is really quite carbon intensive. And so of course, the mayor of Whitby was not very happy that this was in the Toronto Star. It was Pat Perkins, who I believe was a fairly good climate denier at the time. She was not impressed. Ironically, she was the godmother of the woman who wrote the paper with me. The coincidences are bizarre, I agree. But anyways, so this, this made it around, but, but Jackie's still marrying me. And uh, it's, the numbers are still this um, different between different neighborhoods. So, so basically all this says is we know what we need to do. We just don't know if we want to do it. 
Uh, and this is another way of looking at this, the red, you know, the, the more orange and red are more uh, transportation emissions from driving. So transportation is our big challenge in Durham. Same way of looking at that again. All right, so hopefully there's nobody who's now saying, oh, hang on, we're not so sure if, if climate change is here. Uh, just last week, we had a big article in the um, Scientific American. We are on record of 13,000 scientists have actually said the world, it sounds so much like COVID, doesn't it? Yet the scientists are saying, hey, hey, hang on, we're not moving fast enough. The train is coming straight for us. We need to do more. Um, and sure enough, the same thing has been published again. Uh, and the governments are kind of moving, but maybe not moving fast enough. Okay. so. I would argue that the best thing that we can do to address climate change is to build better cities. And building better cities really is it's a three trick pony. People hate density. People love big sprawling cities. And there's, a, there's lots of good reasons for that, but you need a denser city and you need good policy and we need to measure and we need to adjust and we need good governance. Um, a way of looking at this is these are two cities that maybe you're familiar with, Atlanta on the left and Barcelona on the right, roughly the same wealth per person um, and roughly the same population, but that's how much space, the spatial extent of Barcelona on the right, and then there's Atlanta. Atlanta looks like somebody just poured a glass of Coca-Cola on a flat table, right? It's all over the place. Um, and that makes it really difficult to provide low carbon transportation, the houses are bigger, uses more electricity. So Atlanta on the left is 25 tons per person greenhouse gas emissions. Barcelona on the right is about four tons. Barcelona is the city. I don't know how many of you have been to Barcelona. It's a very nice city. You can walk around, it has a beach and mountains and that's why it's actually fairly compact. It just couldn't grow anymore. Um, but it gives us hope because Barcelona is a very livable city and we can get a livable city with, with rich people <laughs> below four tons per capita greenhouse gas emissions. That's kind of the holy grail for now. Um, this is just another way of looking at the same thing. Cities in North America, because they're sprawling, they're all sort of dependent on the car. They're way over there on the top, top left um, and they give far more greenhouse gas emissions per person. However, the big issue, if you go to China or India uh, today uh, and you start talking greenhouse gas emissions, it is not the first priority for the mayor. Right now, obviously the first priority is COVID, but the second priority is often air pollution. Um, cities, big cities, especially in Asia and increasingly in Africa, the air is really badly polluted. Um, and a lot of that is because of coal. Coal really is a four letter word. Um, and it is a problem, both for air pollution or for greenhouse gas emissions. And that may be the biggest uh, benefit that we have is that getting out of coal is the fastest way to improve air quality. This is just another way of showing the difference between density in some cities. This is Shanghai on the left, that flat, you know, pancake of Atlanta on the right. And we can see the same thing with Toronto, see Oshawa, that little bump before Oshawa is actually Whitby and Ajax there compared to Tokyo, um, we're not very dense, are we? I mean, Tokyo is, is um, the, the spikes are a lot higher. Um, okay, this, this slide is really to the second trick of, remember I said we have a three trick pony for a sustainable city. Trick one is, is density, trick two is good public policy. Um, and all this shows, I hope, is you can see how fast the US and Canada dropped. And these are greenhouse gas emissions per person um, since 1967 uh, to 2010. Now, Canada has gone up. We've passed the US since 2010, but you can see that big spike and that is the oil embargo in the 70s. So you can see how fast we can change. COVID is another great example of how fast we can change when we have to. You can see Sweden there. Sweden basically de-industrialized and France as well when the oil embargo hit. Um, France went nuclear and kept their greenhouse gas emissions quite low per person, and so did Sweden. But you can see China growing there, and then India, um, and then if we had uh, Africa as a whole, that will eventually be the biggest blob on the, on the, the map. 
Okay, and then the third thing we have is we have to measure, uh, you know, in God we trust, I love this quote, uh, everyone else bring me data. Um, so we need good data to build better cities. Um, and this is, this is kind of like the, the current Bible of, of, of sustainability people. This is a, a researcher from the Swede, um, Stockholm Environmental Institute, Johan Rockström. And all he's basically saying with this really cool diagram is that we're, and now this has been updated, there are four planetary boundaries that we've uh, gone beyond. Climate change up there on the top is only one. Loss of biodiversity is another one. And you probably have heard about these sustainable development goals. Um, they're, they're what, a, what happens when you get thousands and thousands of people representing 100 and what is it, 197 uh, parties um, trying to come up with, you know, what are the 17 targets to make the world uh, sustainable? These are what we came up with. Um, and the one that we're really focusing on now as a planet is climate change, because that is the most immediate one. This is just a great big slide of, of showing where all the greenhouse gas emissions are coming from. And you can see there is energy. Um, for Toronto, we're really, and this is the GTA, Ajax, Pickering, the whole, all of us, we're at a fork in the road. Um, and really the way we're going to have to, to move to this lower carbon is much, uh, better transportation and more uh, denser communities. Um, this is from a researcher who's now left from Ontario Tech a while ago, created this thing, Blank Ride, which I like to call Uber with a conscience. But these are the sorts of things that we're going to have to come up with, are ways that we, we get around. And I'm going to mention, well, I'll give you a warning that I'm going to mention tolls later on. Okay, so here's back to Ontario. This is us, our contribution. This is the pie for greenhouse gas emissions. And you can see where transportation is, industry, buildings, waste, agriculture, electricity. Electricity is one of the skinniest parts of a pie almost anywhere. Again, because of we started with hydro in Ontario, uh, and then we went to nuclear. We have... Uh, today, I think our, our carbon intensity of our, of our electricity is less than 20 grams per kilowatt hour. Again, among the lowest in the world, which really gives us a, uh, a big push for electric vehicles, this sort of thing. And then we have the same, that big, uh, big thing that I showed you, we've done that for Toronto. Um, and all that oil is, is diesel and gasoline going into transportation. Um, and this is where our greenhouse gas emissions come from, uh, our projection for 2050. Um, okay, and then we've done the same thing for sustainability indicators. Um, and I would argue that sustainable cities um, for Canada, uh, we're about halfway there, so the world, to reach this magic 50% um, uh, uh, urban. So 50% of Canadians lived in cities in 1921, one of the earliest countries in the world. So it's our 100 year anniversary of being an urban country. Um, and the next 100 years will be the, the years that determine not only Canada's cities, because I think we're starting to, to come to grips with the fact that it doesn't matter how good your city is in Canada, if you have a city with a you know, a market that has zoonotic diseases being transmitted in, you know, in Wuhan or, or something in India or wherever, it, we're, all in the, we're all in this together, although it may not always seem that way. So just to, to um, end on what I would say are sort of, what are the top things that we can do for the climate? Um, as individuals, homeowners, businesses, and then institutions. So for us in Durham, um, I would actually say that the first part, well, there's no real priority here, but, but these are the, the five biggies that I came up with, I think. Um, there's, there may be others, but these, are, these, these would be in the top, among the top five. One is what we eat is really important. Um, we need to start eating less meat, but even more important than that is we need to waste a lot less food. We, people the world over, this isn't a Canadian thing or a Durham thing. 
but we're pretty good at it, I'll tell you that. Um, we waste a lot of food. The other thing is that for transportation, um, we as a community, and it's going to need to come from the community. It won't come from our politicians. It won't come from our businesses. We need to start pushing to pay for transportation by the vehicle kilometers traveled. Same way that you pay for electricity, the same way that we pay for, uh, you know, how many times, well, what? Uh, how nice a clothing we buy or how much food we buy. Pricing signals are really important. Um, and we're not paying for transportation through the cost of gas because um, there's lots of externalities, especially as we move to electric vehicles. We need to shift toward the concept that the more you drive, the more you pay. The more people in the car, then it becomes cheaper, these sorts of things. We need ride sharing. We need much, much better transit. And we're going to have to break this uh, love affair that we have with single occupant vehicle SUVs with um, lots and lots of emissions. From an adaptation or a resilience thing, I, I don't know, it'd be nice to see if we could do a show of hands, but how many of you have your 72 hours on your own uh, requirements? So you know that the government and these are different levels of government, but the, both the federal, provincial, and the local governments are all encouraging every one of us to have 72 hours of self-sufficiency. So all of the medicines that you need, enough food, that we in our homes need to be able to be okay without electricity, without anything for 72 hours. This is kind of the social contract that uh, will increasingly become more talked about as we get into more and more climate resilience and adaptation and flooding and power outages and these sorts of things. We're being told that we need to be able to be out on our own for 72 hours. Um, these are the targets. Uh, you may have heard today it's between 40 to 45 percent is what we, anyways, it works out to be about 50 percent um, of our greenhouse gas emissions, we need to reduce by 2035 and 90% by 2050. And again, I don't know how to be how to emphasize that more. Is that that's Herculean? That is a fundamental change of almost everything in our lives to get to those targets that we're already. The government of Canada has legislated that these are the targets that we're going to meet. Um, I'm skeptical but it's important that we be upfront about just how big a challenge this is. And the last thing that I wanted to mention is if you look at how COVID is, how our response to COVID is happening right now in Canada and around the world, it's not as good as it could be. I think everybody would agree to that. Um, Canada is a unique country in that we have among the strongest federal um, the provinces have more powers than just about any other country in the world, far more power than the equivalent U.S. state, for example. Um, and we, as Canadians, we love to have one government party in Ottawa and another one in our provincial capitals often. And they're just hardwired to be grumpy with each other. And we as the voter and we as the Twitterer and the social media inputters are becoming a lot less patient and a lot less civil, I would argue. And if we ever need to up our game on good governance, you know, this is supposed to be what Canadians are good at, is, is another way of saying that is good civility. Kindness goes a long way in governing, and we're going to need a lot more of that, I think. So I put that, I don't know how to put that into words yet, but I just wanted to put that out there as one of my top five. Okay, so this is the same thing, but now for businesses. So I think businesses, even though I say it should come from us as a community, businesses should be very aggressive in Durham to start encouraging the politicians and the community and providing the service, of course, as well, moving toward this pay as you drive, um, but a much better system. There should be an easy bus from easy, you know, every 15 minutes, I should be able to get a bus from Ontario Tech to downtown Oshawa and then to the GO station. Um, we're just, we have not kept pace with good transit. Um, we also need to move to these things where 
it's crazy that we have 10, 15, especially now with lots of people working from home, different delivery vehicles passing by our houses. The first it's the Canada Post, then it's UPS, then it's FedEx, then it's the pizza delivery, then it's the newspaper. Surely we can coordinate that and have those deliveries consolidated and be much more efficient. Um, businesses have to take this environment, social and governance much more seriously. Um, it's all connected. It's, it's women on the board. It's considering the environment. It's equity. It's indigenous. It's good governance. And that means good information, honest integrity. Um, it's a big deal. Again, businesses have to get off of uh, fossil fuels, a big challenge. We also, you've started to hear a lot of businesses and increasingly the communities are also saying, oh, you know, we've got net zero targets. We're gonna get, you know, um, uh, net zero by 2050. Well, these have to be all of our emissions. So the hamburger that we buy, if it came from beef that was grown in Brazil, from a rainforest that were cut down, we're going to have to start measuring those emissions and we need our businesses to help with that. The grow to where the puck is going to steal that from Wayne Gretzky is we need businesses. Yes, businesses by their nature, there will be many that are going to lobby to maintain the status quo. That's just the way business is, but we need lots of new businesses and existing businesses to read the room and to read what's going on and to move us in that direction. So how do you do your business with 80% less fossil fuel? Again, blame less, cooperate more. Um, I know I put that there and you're saying good luck, but I thought I'd put it there. Um, and then this is for our last slide for our institutions and our governments. Um, again, I'm only putting this out there as sort of a talking point, but I, you know, I know the US news picked Canada as the number one country in the world again, and there's all these Canadians, yay, look how good we are. I think that we're eroding the civility in our country and we need to be improving it to be able to, ha to weather the upcoming storm. And I would have hoped that COVID would be the thing, if we could ever get some good out of something so bad that it's teaching us as individuals, as government, local governments, as a country, how to work better together. I know that sounds, I'm an engineer, so that's as far as I can get, sorry. Anyways, transportation, um, governments and institutions, they're going to have to move us toward this. They're going to have to charge us for parking, all these things we don't like. Again, businesses and, or sorry, governments have to be pushing this uh, partnership with the community, this three-day road to resilience. We've got to be able to be on our own for 72 hours, which is really a big deal. Um, being serious about these climate targets, uh, that's going to be really difficult. And again, blame less and cooperate more. Um, and with that, I would be very happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for your presentation. And there were quite a few questions. Oh, uh, so we will get great. to those. Um, so the first question is, has the pandemic had any positive effect on climate change? Um, since people are driving and flying less and many people aren't commuting, commuting to work anymore? Great question. Yes, it's about a 9% globally, I think, reduction in carbon emissions. But the thing that I think uh, actually people working in climate change are a little bit shocked by how little of an impact, because you would think with all of us at home and all of that, that the numbers should be dropping even more, but they, they, there was a, a, a slight decline, but not nearly as much as we would have liked. So yes, but not as much as we would have liked. Okay, great. And if anyone has any other questions, please continue to enter them in the chat. Um, the next question is, so gas has a larger carbon footprint and what can we do to combat this? We should, every new subdivision in, in Durham after a certain point, let's pick a date, 2025, should have a heat pump, not a natural gas furnace. Um, we should be moving to geothermal. Come to Ontario Tech, have a look at Polonsky Field. It's one of the best geothermal heating, cooling systems for building um, anywhere. Um, we should almost, you know, sorry, I hope there's nobody from Enbridge or Union Gas listening in, but we should have a date that says, you know, buy whatever, 
you just can't heat your house with gas anymore. Not the way we're doing it now. It just doesn't make any sense. Sorry, I have a gas furnace too. So I'm in the same boat, everybody. Thank you. Um, are there any countries in the world who have taken positive steps to fight climate change who we can look to as examples? I know you mentioned Barcelona has done well um, in that image that you've shown, but are there any other countries? Oh, many, many. I would say, you know, it's hard to find a better jurisdiction than Ontario in terms of uh, decarbonizing our electricity. We, we got rid of coal way before anybody else, almost anybody else. Huge accomplishment. So that's a good one. Um, we have uh, lots of wind power in Norway, Scandinavia. Um, we have uh, we have lots of places that are moving to better transit. We have yeah, Barcelona is a great example. I think the trick is is that you got to look at all these places and say, okay, not necessarily how do we should do that tomorrow, but how would that work here in Durham? because it's not always that, the, tr the translation isn't always exact, but yeah, tons and tons and tons of examples. Great, thank you. And what has Barcelona done to achieve the small footprint? <laughs> a lot that they did, a lot was just by where they were located. So Barcelona is, um, is, is, has the ocean on one side and mountains on the other side. I don't know if, how many people have been to, um, well, Vancouver is another is another city that was forced to grow quite dense. So is um, uh, Seattle, um, where they just said, "Sorry, you can't you can't build up on the mountains." So you you ended up with a quite a dense footprint of of community, and that was probably the thing that Barcelona Barcelona did. They didn't do anything; they just were in a lucky location. Um, they also have low carbon electricity, um, and they have really good transit. So those are probably the top three. Great, and speaking of transit, somebody has asked, how can we make public transportation better in Durham? And I know there was also a, a comment in the chat that somebody's bus uh, had recently been canceled their, re their route. So do you have any thoughts on how we can improve public transportation in Durham? He, well, <laughs> yes, many, I suppose. Mm -hmm. One of the one thing about transport, so, the more convenient you make it and the more you look at it as a system, the better, really. So it has to be integrated with a bicycle or an e-scooter or ride sharing or buses that work or trains that work. Part of the problem, you know, we have a Durham Transit, we have a Go Transit, we have in, so we've basically given up oftentimes on transit because it's been so fractured and we have a fight between Durham Transit and Go, or we have a fight between Go and, you know, we had a, a classic example was, you know, it was Durham that was one of the most uh, opposed to tolls on the Don Valley and the Gardner, um, which probably would have benefited people in Durham more than anyone because it would have improved traffic, but we didn't, you know, so we always sort of take transit, transportation, and we cut it up into little pieces. And then we all, everybody has a piece of it and we end up fighting with the pieces. So the first thing I would do is, is, is have, take a much more comprehensive integrated look at it and include walking and bicycling and ride sharing. You know, there's a great pilot in, in Belleville where you get bus on demand. Um, so we don't have to go that far. It's not all that far to Belleville and things, things it, it's, it's things, it's, it's doable, I guess is the short answer. Great, thank you. Somebody had asked, seeing what's happening in the world, what gives the most hope? This, how many people showed up tonight? I mean, Greta Thunberg, I mean, my students, uh, people, I think everybody gets this. Um, everybody wants to help. Um, it's the solutions this well, I shouldn't say this as we try and get you know students to come to Ontario Tech as a you know come for energy engineering or whatever but that's not the hard part it's the technology whether it's hydrogen or low carbon electricity or electric vehicles we know how to do this it's making the social transition that's the hardest part it's figuring out how to do this together that 
somebody in a, uh, you know, a postal code X doesn't complain because somebody in postal code Y is getting their vaccine two days before they are, these sorts of things. It's really difficult to govern ourselves, which then becomes really difficult to improve the situation. The stuff is all connected. Um, so the thing that gives me most hope is that um, once we decide we wanna fix this, it's not that difficult to fix it. Kind of famous last words, I suppose. Great, thanks. And I know you had also <laughs> said um, with COVID, we've seen how quickly people have been able to change and adjust to change and adapt. So I think that's quite hopeful as well. Yeah, for, for sure. Um, so the next question is here in Canada, we think we are very clean and nice, um, but based on your knowledge of the world, what don't you think we know or realize? I don't, I mean, I don't, again, I would love to see if we could have a show of hands. How many people know that Canadians pretty well, every year if we had wasteful Olympics, who uses and wastes the most energy, generates the most greenhouse gas emissions and generates the most garbage in the world per person, do we know that it's Canadians? We are the most wasteful community on earth. I mean, and, and that's just, people will say, well, we're a big country and it's cold. No, not really. I mean, that's part of it, but it's largely, we, we, our DNA is a resource you know, economy, you know, cut down the trees, dig up the, this, and we'll just make that. And we're getting there, but I'm not sure that Canadians fully appreciate just how out of sync we are with the rest of the world when it comes to energy and material consumption. Because we're in the top three, you know, every year we're, we're the biggies. So I definitely other... didn't know that. And I'm sure there are others who didn't know that as well. Uh oh, sorry, didn't mean to. <laughs> the next question is we reinforce businesses like Amazon with our addiction to one to two day turnarounds where we order several things multiple times a week because of a flat fee annual subscription that allows for this more deliveries equals more packages. So maybe we should as consumers stop reinforcing this. Sure, I guess that's more of a, a comment. That's more of a comment. It's a good comment, although I got to tell you, I love, I love Amazon. Yes. So, okay. So that is a great point. So I would argue that there's maybe three, there's three or more responses to that. One is that I should, so I'm making a big effort not to buy books on Amazon because they're not any much, they're not really that much cheaper, but I buy them from the local bookstore because I want them to stay in business. Two, I really think that the, and we could start in Durham, the local government should charge every delivery company for how many kilometers they drive on the road. It's easy, put a GPS in every uh, UPS, every FedEx, every delivery vehicle um, and charge 10 cents a kilometer, whatever it is. And that will make Amazon respond. It's like a carbon tax, it's, it's just, People are great at responding to incentives. So make an incentive that it, it's not free to drive by my house six or seven times, delivering a newspaper once and Amazon the other time and then FedEx and then whatever. That would be the second. Um, and the third is that we as a community, we as local governments could probably come up with a consolidated delivery system. And we're kind of at the, where, the, where we were when, when mail started to be delivered across the, the country, right? So we can do it again. Great points, thank you. Uh, the next question is with more people expected to work from home even post COVID, will this have any significant impact? Mm, I'm guessing no, because humans are, you know, it's like, so if we don't get our fix of, of talking sports and, and gossip and love and, you know, who, who, who you know, basically the soap operas of our lives with, with the people at work, we'll do it with the people down the road. We, we might walk, but, but humans are a very social animal. So we might travel less for work, but I think we'll end up traveling for, um, for other, for, for social purposes. I think it's great to work from home. And I think that COVID has changed. I think as we move back into the post COVID, there's lots of great lessons that we might be able to take, but I think humans will still um, want to move around and interact with each other almost as much as before, just differently. 
Okay, and the next question is, how do we as a community try to push public policy towards developing sustainable cities? Well, I vote the right people. If you don't like them, run yourself. Um, pay attention, follow the, the things at the Ajax library. Um, the, I think most people are, I mean, we're a pretty, pretty engaged community in, in, in Durham and, and, and Ontario. Um, you know, we saw the, we don't always get it right. That's part of the issue when it comes to how we respond to, to signals, you know, we're kind of sometimes a bit of a, a, a bull with a red flag. And, you know, so we tend to, to go off on social media against this or that or whatever, but we tend to, you know, the, what is it? The, the arc of human action. And we, we tend to, to move towards better policies. I think, I think that probably the biggest thing is to cut our, our politicians a bit of slack in terms of immediate responses but less slack in terms of if you set a target, tell me where we are honestly with regard to that target. I don't know if that helps. It's a bit of a cop out of an answer, but. No, that's a great point. Um, and then the next question is how can we get geothermal used in Durham? Can we change a home to this? For example, retrofit. E not easy. Um, we have, well, actually I should put a plug in for Durham College as well, because Durham College is just, have built that great big um, uh, addition um, in Oshawa and their geothermal now as well. There's two really in, uh, great examples among the best in Canada, right in Oshawa. Um, geothermal tends to work better for larger buildings, not so much a single family home, although sooner or later it will. For a single family homes, it's more of a, of a, of a heat pump that is, is probably a better bet. There's a, a Durham region is doing a big home retrofit. So lots of opportunity coming for many things. Great. And someone's asked, did the driving lesson increase in deliveries just balance each other out so that there was very little change in reality? E great question. Um, don't know. It's, I mean, we, we may see some of the numbers with, with I mean, I, I, uh, I'm, lucky to be able to work from home but i listened to um cbc in the morning and i'm just dumbfounded when you know, the traffic report right now it, you know the highways seem to be pretty busy and 401 is is backed up right now as everybody's supposed today and everybody's supposed to be you know work you know we're, we're in a lockdown but so i don't know it's a great question though but it's one of those things that you know it's little little big big right we can nibble away at this problem if we know that you know, so that we have a place in, near Young and Eglin. And one day I was sitting at home and I spent the day and I counted 28 delivery vehicles between eight and 12 the past the, that's just crazy. So that's really a function of, that's an externality that's not being incorporated into the price. So that's just charging, start with delivery vehicles, uh, a fee per kilometers traveled, um, and then and then move from there, I think. Great, thank you. Um, so someone's asked, baby boomers up to this time have had a big impact. How are you seeing the changes in demographics and age impacting everything? Uh, well, as I mentioned, I think demographics and urbanization are the two, you know, I, I try and tell my students, if you if you wanna learn how to surf, the waves that you wanna figure out are, are demographics and urbanization. So demographics are different in every country. Uh, so yes, lots of baby boomers in the OECD. It was the baby boomers who got the, got, you know, generated a lot of wealth, but now we're starting to see population declines already in China. Uh, Russia isn't replacing population anymore. Japan isn't. Um, Baby boomers, maybe the biggest thing that they'll end up doing is baby boomers are about to have the largest transfer of wealth in human history, because I guess I'm a baby boomer. We're all going to die <laughs> some, some sooner than later, um, and that wealth will be transferred to our kids or to, to things that we want. Um, 
So yeah, so I think baby boomers have had a huge impact. I think the, you know, that baby boomers are now getting a bit of an earful and rightly so from the likes of, you know, Greta Thunberg and the equivalents of Greta in, in, in Canada in Durham. Um, and it's, it's because there is a very valid point in them saying, and, and the point is even more valid, I would argue for Betu in, in Mozambique, right? Is that, hey, you guys, you're the ones who cause the problem and you're not paying the price in terms of the problem. So yes, so um, I think the baby boomers are coming to grips with that, but it's very difficult because we kind of got used to where we are, right? And we don't, we don't really want to change because we're fairly comfortable, um, but I think we'll be forced into it. And I think by the time it's all said and done, yes, it's a huge change, but I, don't, I think we'll be better for it coming out of it. Great, thank you. And we have a question, is methane emissions from cattle and livestock in Canada a serious concern for global warming? Yes, so methane is a more powerful greenhouse gas than, than carbon. It has a, a greater impact short term. Methane is a big deal uh, from cattle. It depends on how the cattle are raised. A grass-fed cattle is a lot less than uh, you know, in, in, in intensive livestock. Um, but yeah, so that's why beef, um, beef, and I think lamb, um, lamb as well is significant, uh, greenhouse gas impact. It's from the, the methane generation, uh, as well as the feed. Um, so it's just a very inefficient way to raise protein. Um, and so, and part of the challenge there is that it's being replicated around the world. So yes, short answer is methane is a big deal. It's about, we had it on that slide. Agricultural emissions are about 6% of the total greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and in Durham, ha, I can even get you that number. Durham, uh, just in Durham alone, agricultural emissions are 3%. Ah, see, there you actually have the Durham retrofit model. This is this. See what you can find at the library. This is. In, um, how do I feel about the future of Canada? Yes, that was the next question. See, I'm I'm very bullish on Canada. I think Canada is a wonderful country. Sometimes I think Canadians are a bit too. I mean, everybody uh, everybody whines about Canadians being smug, but. Um, I think Canadians are, when the chips are down, we're a really good country to have on your side. Um, you know, and I think, I think we're now just sort of figuring out how we're going to work together as an Alberta and an Ontario and a conservative and a liberal and an NDP. Um, and once we do that, we'll be, we'll be pretty impressive, I think. We're also, Canada has a bigger challenge than most countries, even though, you know, Ontario did quite well with uh, reducing carbon in electricity. But, you know, we have an entire province in Alberta, plus a big chunk of Saskatchewan, that is, is rich um, and is really dependent on fossil fuel as their economy. So we're going to have to work with them as a province as they transition out of fossil fuel. That is a big challenge. Um, Newfoundland gets a lot of money from off, offshore oil, for example. Um, the other thing that we have in Canada that's a challenge is that all of the electricity in Canada is determined by the province. So the federal government doesn't have that much latitude to lead because it's a provincial decision how we generate our electricity. Um, so that's, um, but where future of Canada, I think is, well, the other future of Canada that I think is really worth mentioning, especially in Durham and where the pressures are going to come from, is if you look at all those hundred and, well, the largest 140 cities in the world, arguably the two cities best positioned to weather the climate storm are Toronto, GTA, Durham, and Chicago. And that's because our climate is pretty moderate. So we will get wetter, wilder, and warmer days, but we'll have fewer of them relative to a lot of other cities. Um, there's gonna be a lot of mayhem in places like Jakarta, Manila, uh, Shanghai, because we're going to see uh, sea level rise. We're gonna have more coastal flooding. 
So Canada is going to have a lot of pressure on it between now and the end of this century from, from climate refugees even more so. Um, so, and, and we'll have to make sure that we also figure out, especially in Ontario, how to protect um, the Great Lakes. They're gonna be under a lot of stress. Great, thank you. Um, someone's asked, what can we do to keep Durham region unique from other regions? Probably nothing. And I'm not sure that, you know, maybe I shouldn't be quite so flippant. Um, so, I'm not sure. This is, I mean, this is, this is, this isn't really a climate change discussion. This is a philosophical discussion maybe over a beer at the pub kind of thing. But I'm amazed sometimes at the desire for Durham to be different from Toronto and from York to be different from Toronto. And from some of the things I've heard from people in Durham saying, oh, those terrible people in Toronto and the people in Toronto saying, oh, you know, the people out in the rural areas, we really are one big urban area. I mean, I don't know what the numbers is. I think it's like 45% of the people in Durham work in Toronto or used to. So we're all in this together. Um, so the distinctiveness and uniqueness of Durham, probably the, the best thing is how we get along, how Ajax gets along with Whitby, how Whitby gets along with Uxbridge, how we get along with the regional government. This is hard. I mean, being human is difficult because we always want to be sort of grumpy with somebody else, whether it's a, you know, a an Ajax mayor doesn't like this or a counselor here or we don't like that or you know our political affiliation is different from that I think the uniqueness I don't know I do think I mean Durham of course is unique in that we're the you know we're the last big region in the GTA where growth is going to happen um, we have lots of housing still to come we have lots of growth we have I guess the uniqueness for Durham if I had to answer that question on an exam would be that we're still we're the last region that has a chance to do it right in the GTA because everybody else is pretty well built over. That's a great point. And how much does the USA impact what we do in Canada? <laughs> a lot, I guess is the short answer. Um, it's like, you know, the, 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 the physics equation, right? Uh, you know, the, the size of the, the mass and the, the gravitational pull and all of that. I think we actually, Canada probably influences the US more than we think. Um, the US has an enormous impact on Canada. I mean, it's not for nothing that Justin Trudeau today increased the ambition of Canada's climate reduction targets, right? because it was Joe Biden who was, who was basically saying, this is what we're doing in the US. Hey, UK, what are you doing? Hey, Canada, what are you doing? So um, what the US does is, is, is a, has a big impact in, on Canada for sure. And, and I think it will for the foreseeable future. Thank you. And I have a final question. I've heard that there are ways to pull carbon from the air in the cement industry. Is this encouraging? Every, I mean, every little bit helps, right? Um, so yes, it's encouraging. Uh, it's not cheap though. Um, I guess that's the answer, isn't it? At the end of the day, this $170 a ton carbon tax that's being being uh, proposed, right? It's it's a powerful way of, of um, making a lot of these things become more real. So yes, um, again, technologically, we can do anything. I mean, we can put a man on the moon, right? Sooner we'll put a woman on the moon, right? We can do anything technologically. So yes, we can do that. It's usually a question of money. Um, so, but yes. And we also have the ability to sequester carbon. We can compress it and we can stick it underground too. We have lots of tricks up our sleeve. It's nice to end on that encouraging and hopeful note. Um, before we wrap up, I just have a quick poll question. Um, so that is, after attending this presentation, have you learned at least one thing you can do to help the environment? Are you feeling inspired? Are you thinking about a way that you can make a change to make a difference? Um, so I'll just leave that up for a few more seconds here. I'm seeing a lot of yeses so far, so that's encouraging. Just give it about five more seconds. Okay. 
So 100% of our audience has said yes. So that's very hopeful. Wow. Well, 100% of the ones who stuck stuck through the long anyway. <laughs> So I just wanted to um, give a huge thank you to Dr. Dan Hornwig for sharing your expertise with us tonight and for providing such valuable information that will help us all make a difference. And thank you to our audience for attending and participating. You had some great questions. Um, and the, I also wanted to remind you that the library has a lot of excellent items on climate change, including books, ebooks, audiobooks, and streaming videos that talk about climate change and how we can make a difference. And I know Sarah had shared that link in the chat. Um, if you have any feedback about tonight's program, please feel free to share it in the chat. And this event has been recorded. So if you wish to watch it again or to forward it to friends and family, please check our website over the next few days. So thank you very much, everyone, and good night. Thanks, everyone.